The Honourable the President. Senator Me. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank you for this opportunity to give a short contribution on today's private motion brought by Senator Wademark on the financial and administrative autonomy of the Parliament. Uh, and of course, I want to endorse the opening statement that uh, uh, autonomy of the Parliament is a benchmark of true democracy, and so today I am pleased to present. Madam President, um, I want to begin by indicating that I was happy to hear the response from the government side in support of the motion. However, I was rather disappointed to hear from the honorable member that even though the government supports given Parliament its autonomy in principle, that it appears it is not a priority of the government at this time. And I feel particularly disappointed because like Senator Mark, I recall the contribution of the leader of government business, the um, Honorable Franklin Khan, where he indicated, uh, and I got the impression during another debate that uh, work will begin and that the government was keen on um, ensuring that the parliament got the necessary support to become truly independent. Mr. and Madam President, so I want to touch on a few um, academic principles when it comes to parliament and the uh, independence and sovereignty of parliaments. Parliament so sovereignty also called parliamentary supremacy or legislative supremacy, is a concept in the constitutional law of some parliamentary democracies. It holds that the legislative body has absolute sovereignty and is supreme over all other government institutions, including the executive or judicial bodies, a point that was made earlier. And so it, it also holds that the legislative body may change or repeal any previous legislation, which we do here from time to time. And so it is not bound by written law in some cases, even a constitution or by precedent. Parliamentary sovereignty may be contrasted with separation of powers, which limits the legislature's scope, often to general lawmaking and judicial review, where laws passed by the legislature may be declared invalid in certain circumstances. And Madam President, in our own jurisdiction, we recently had where the appointment, the process to appoint a commissioner of police was struck down by the uh, judiciary uh, because it was, um, it was challenged there because it went against what is in our constitution, which remains supreme. Parliament, in the strictest sense of the word in the mouth of the lawyers, um, means the king, the House of Lords, the House of Commons. Um, these three body, bodies acting together um, is conferred that power and constitute Parliament. And we have inherited that Westminster system. The principle of parliamentary sovereignty means neither more nor less than this, namely that parliament, thus defined, has under the English constitution the right to make or unmake any law, whatever, and further that no person or body is recognized by the law of England as having a right to override that set aside or set aside the legislation of parliament. Madam President, the, um, the, there was a, I, I did some reading, um, there was a book called The Study of Law of the Constitution, nine, published in 1985, A.V. Dicey, um, where they spoke about three main points in, of parliamentary supremacy, and it's your 
permission, I just want to introduce that. Um, one is that Parliament can make laws concerning anything. Two, Parliament can bind a few. No Parliament can bind a future Parliament. That is, it cannot pass a law that cannot be changed or reversed by a future Parliament. And this, of course, gives the members of Parliament in the future the opportunity to make laws as they see fit without being bound to what would have taken place previously. The third is a valid act of, pra of Parliament cannot be questioned by the court and that the Parliament is a supreme lawmaker. Madam President, I really choose to explore some of these um, theories and pronouncements because in every debate that we have in this House, I ask myself, how do we as members of Parliament make contributions that resonate with the people of Trinidad and Tobago that are relevant to the lives and the improvement of the <coughs> lives of our citizens. And I really see this debate as an opportunity to educate and to share information with our citizens on what parliament ought to be. Because there are many who feel that parliament is an extension of the government. Mm. And we know that the constitution sets out that there are um, three separate arms of state as outlined by two previous speakers before me. The executive, which is the prime minister and his cabinet, judiciary, and of course led by the chief justice, and the legislative, which is the parliament, which is very separate from the cabinet. And in fact, in practice, many times, I am certain that in various governments, the decisions with regards to certain matters in Parliament really is made by the, ex the executive, by the cabinet. And as far as possible, we ought to protect our Parliament from that. Madam President, I just want to go on to mention that I, Trinidad and Tobago, is, a, is a, a republic with a representative government and a certain degree of regional autonomy. The head of state is a non-executive president elected by an electoral college comprising of all the members of parliament. The executive is led by the prime minister who heads the cabinet and the cabinet is chosen by the prime minister of course and they are responsible to parliament. The, legislative, the legislature contains the bicameral, the legislature consists of the bicameral parliament with a directly elected 41 member house of representatives, the lower house, and of course 31 members in the Senate. Senators are appointed by the president, 16 on the advice of the prime minister, and many of, the, of our colleagues here who have been appointed by the Prime Minister, in fact, government ministers serving in the cabinet as well. Six on the advice of the leader of opposition and nine on the president of the president's own choice. They are expected to maintain their independent voices. Um, Madam, Prime, Madam President, although the president does not sit in parliament, our structure gives that he is responsible for the summonsing, the prorogation, and the dissolution of parliament. And also, of course, he gives his assent to the bills that are debated here. I think it's important for us all as members of parliament, but also for the institution that is parliament, to protect that um, responsibility of the parliament so that the prorogation and the summons in and so on of Parliament does not become um, something that is in the domain of the executive. Parliament has the power to amend or change the constitution and in some cases a simple majority of the members voting in each house is all that is required. Other sections of the constitution are considered to be entrenched. This means they cannot be altered by a simple majority of votes in Parliament, but that a special majority is needed. 
Madam President, one of the um, protections that we as members of parliament have is that uh, generally members of parliament cannot be sued or criminal charges cannot come out of things that are said in parliament or uh, reports or committees that are related to the work of parliament. Ministers may attend the sittings of either house and of course from time to time ministers come to the Senate to answer questions. Uh, but they don't take part in our debates and, uh, and vote where they are not a member of the House. The powers of both houses are similar and an important, um, one of the important differences I want to refer to is our power when it comes to bills relating to money. The House of Representatives uh, can override the Senate if it delays in passing a money bill, or in certain cases, if the Senate, um, if the Senate does not pass that bill. Madam President, this brings me to a point that was touched on earlier, and that is funding. Um, it was mentioned, of course, and I want to endorse that there are many instances where um, in other jurisdictions where corporate bodies are established as a method of improving the par parliament's uh, utilization of its resources, as well as giving them that independence uh, from the executive. There was a, an American um, legislator, he was a writer and a consultant and so on. His name was Bob Barr. And in one of his books, he said that um, accepting federal funding undermines state sovereignty as states become beholden to federal requirements in order to keep the money flowing. Madam President, while our system is very different from the American system of government, that principle is applicable here in Trinidad and Tobago so far as the state provides funding to the parliament. And autonomy should not be an empty shell, a, a, a phrase, but it really should be made a concrete reality uh, in which uh, there are various ways depending, and, uh, in, depending on the jurisdictions, there are different uh, methods that are used to ensure that autonomy becomes something real. Autonomy is defined in effect by, on one hand, the non-dependence and the non-subordination of parliaments in relation to the executive or the cabinet. And on the other, by the possibility of the parliament freeing itself, at least partially, from the rules of ordinary law, so as to follow in its stead, instead its own regulations. And these regulations extend, of course, to regulations regarding their staff, their functioning, and, and that was mentioned previously in the debate. Mr. Madam President, I want to just touch on two essential aspects of autonomy, which both has to do with uh, budget. One is budgetary autonomy, and the other is drawing upon the budget. Uh, uh, one common feature in all parliaments, with the exception of two, one in Zambia and one in um, Bundesrat in Germany, the budget of each assembly is voted on in the plenary session. Numerous assemblies noted, numerous parliaments throughout the world noted that it is hardly debated or not at all and agreed without amendment even when successively examined by two chambers in bicameral parliaments. And Madam President, before I proceed, I just want to tell you that this um, came from a report prepared by Mr. Michael Kudrek of France entitled The Administrative and Financial Autonomy of Parliamentary Assemblies. And that was uh, presented, adopted in the Moscow session in uh, September 1998. And it included a study, it really was a study of all countries with independent, well, with parliaments and examining their level of independence. The second I mentioned earlier was the drawing of the budget, which is, which is also part of the report. And the report stated it is worth considering that the preparation of the draft national budget before its presentation and the vote in plenary session constitutes 
the determining phase for gauging the autonomy of each parliament. How will our parliament measure up when it comes to that? Between the moment when the initial draft is prepared by the parliamentary departments and the presentation of the definitive draft to the parliament for debate or to the Minister of Finance for inclusion in the general draft budget, then debate and vote by parliament. Two different situations are apparent. In two thirds of the countries with parliamentary auton autonomy, Parliament draws up their draft budget without the intervention of the government. And I think that is the direction that we would want to go. The parliamentary authorities alone decide on the amount and the distribution of the expenditure. It follows on from this that the parliamentary authorities are careful not to present a budget with, which bears no relation to the general budget of the state and that they take into account in particular of its rate of increase of economic policy and even announced austerity measures. And recently we have had a lot of those from our government, our Minister of Finance. But at the end of the day, the parliament remains free to construct their budget without the intervention of the Ministry of Finance. In, in this report, one third of parliaments are, by contrast, subject to the intervention of the Ministry of Finance. Negotiations take place between the parliamentary authorities who draw up the budget in almost all cases before the parliamentary authority, um, that includes the speaker or president and the committees and so on, um, and they then adopt the draft. In several cases, the intervention goes so far as imposing a decision as was demonstrated in Zambia and in the Australian Parliament. By contrast, though, the majority of states with autonomous parliaments seem to enjoy a genuine financial autonomy, even though the draft budget is submitted for examination by the Minister of Finance. Madam President, in our country, well, that was the end of the part of the report. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam President, our parliament is largely subjected to the whims of the Minister of Finance, whoever that may be, um, for its general budget, since allocations are determined by the Minister of Finance. The parliament, in fact, is really treated as any government agency or department and remains subjected to the minister. The fact is that the minister is, at present, responsible for paying the salaries of the President of the Senate as well as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And of course, uh, this leaves a question with regards to how independent these offices can be. And it goes, uh, it extends further to the clerk of the House and the, um, and the, the staff in general as to their ability to really be independent. I uh, want to endorse a point made by independent Senator Danishwar Mahabi earlier that uh, at present THA receives a fixed percentage of the national budget. Whether, uh, well at present that is 4%, but a similar decision should be made for matters pertaining to the judiciary and to the parliament. And whatever percentage that ends up being, I am in favor of it being a fixed percentage of the national budget. Madam President, the, there are several models that exist, um, that the, and I want to implore the government that, you know, while you may not see it as a priority, because I do agree that there are a number of pressing issues in our society at the moment, um, <laughs> That doesn't mean that you can't get the ball rolling. That doesn't mean that you cannot have your committees set up to take recommendations. There are a number of technocrats, learned academics as well, who will be willing to contribute to ensure that our parliament remains um, autonomous and our protection of our democracy remains uh, paramount. So if the government really is committed to parliamentary autonomy as they claim to be, I, do, I think they will find um, a mechanism to ensure that the process begins to, um, to bring parliamentary autonomy into being. Madam President, 
I mentioned that the um, the cover, current structure in terms of funding, um, the administrative structure and the governance of parliament is similar to that of any government um, department of, of government ministries. The staff at the parliament also are public servants, um, whether it is contract employees or members of the service, they are employed through the Public Service Commission and their terms and conditions of employment are determined by the Civil Service Act. Um, and of course the CPO also has a role. Does that really give them the independence? Uh, I think another speaker mentioned the fact that members of um, the Parliament staff could be moved to another ministry based on um, promotion, based on a, a vacancy that arises, and all of their training would have gone down the drain because the particular training required for parliamentary procedures is very specific and it will not be applicable in other ministries. Madam President, I know that uh, um, in previous terms there would have been a lot of training of staff even the police officers attached to the parliament are specifically trained for their duties in parliament. And their duties are very, very different to police officers who are attached to, let's say, the magistrate's court or even a police station. And so the training that they would have received here in terms of a parliamentary procedure and so on may not be applicable to them in other places. The same goes for um, the procedures in terms of financial appropriations um, and uh, where, where we, the parliament would follow the procedures established for ministries. And of course it requires the parliament to be accountable and to report to the ministry. So at this time, when the Ministry of Finance has to release funds to the parliament for its business, the parliament, of course, must account because it is taxpayers' dollars. It, it, it accounts back to the Ministry of Finance. And again, here you have um, something that goes against the whole idea of separation of powers. Madam President, there are a number of countries, and I think some were mentioned before, and I want to mention three, um, Canada, the UK, and Scotland. In Canada, there is a managing body that is called the Board of Internal Economy. It is a statutory body and acts upon all financial and administrative matters respecting members of the House of Commons, the House um, itself and its premises, its services and its staff. And they have an act of parliament called, um, that makes provisions for that. In Trinidad and Tobago, we do have um, statutory bodies and we do have models that we can follow and um, perhaps integrate to produce something that may be unique but in principle follows that uh, model that gives autonomy. In the United Kingdom, of course, there's the House of Commons. Um, the House of Commons has its own administration and they operate under um, their own Act of 19 that went, uh, was passed in 1978. And their principal managing body is the, um, is the House of Commons Commission. The Speaker of the House chairs the Commission. Uh, the Commission would prepare the, the financial estimates and so on, which would, be, which would be laid in the House as part of the normal budgetary process. And uh, so there is no real formal role for the Treasury. And that is a feature that is regarded as giving the Parliament a large degree of uh, um, independence. Madam President, um, Scotland, of course, Scotland in, has a number of unique features in its governance system. Um, but they established a body called the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body generally called the, Parliament, the Parliamentary Corporation, to f perform the function um, of providing for Parliament or to, be in, to ensure that Parliament is provided with the property, the staff and the services required for their purpose. 
the Australian Parliamentary Service has its own separate and amendable appropriation bill. The, Federation, the Federal Parliament has adopted a system which distances its funding from the funding of government services generally. And I think that is the direction that we want to head in. And ma Madam President, I must say that this is my first term as a, pa as a member of parliament. And the, the support staff that ensures that things run smoothly in this parliament, they do a tremendous job. Um, Madam President, when we, um, when members of the public ask, when we have a sitting that goes into wee hours of the morning and members of the pu public say, you know, how all they could do that, how all they could sit down there for all these hours, I often think of the members of staff who are often here for the Number entire right. debate and they come before as well to prepare. And uh, Mr. Um, Madam President, I think the staff would have done a tremendous job in ensuring that uh, this parliament as an institution functions with integrity and with great efficiency. For that reason, I think it would make giving autonomy in law much easier. <coughs> Because even though this parliament does not at present have autonomy for its administration and particularly for its financial business, the um, management of the, of the parliament has ensured that all of its practices are in line with best practices internationally. And for that purpose, I think um, I want to endorse that the government take the necessary steps to have it in, in, um, in law, to have that separation, to take it a step further. Because quite frankly, I think the practices of the parliament thus far will make it much easier because they have been doing an exemplary job as a parliament. The, the, what, and I mentioned earlier that Anytime we have a debate as representatives of people, we must ask ourselves what is in this for the citizen? What is in this for the citizen? The protection of our democracy. Madam President, there are many ways in which our democracy could be taken for granted. And I just want to, um, to introduce, well, to mention a quote in terms of what is democracy. Um, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, democracy is government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And he, well, he said, sorry, Lincoln said that de democracy is by far the most challenging form of government. Of course, this could be taken um, in different ways. But the fact is that democracy has its challenges both for the politicians as well as for the people. And the term democracy comes from the Greek language and means rule by the simple people. The simple people, the ordinary citizen, the average citizen, the average Jew. The so-called, um, that so-called class of simple people um, in, of course, in, in um, ancient times, the ruling class lived very separately from the simple people who had no option and no input in decision making. But in modern democracy, we have seen a move in terms of concentration of power and abuse of power by rulers. Uh, yet the theory of modern democracy was not formulated until the, what was called the Age of Enlightenment, which was the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries, where philosophers defined the essential elements of democracy, and it included a separation of power, the basic civil rights or human rights, religious liberty, and separation of church and state. 
and Trinidad and in Trinidad and Tobago is a democracy. Democracy is a form of government where the Constitution guarantees basic personal and political rights, free and fair elections, and independent courts of law. So, Madam President, if I am to say to any citizen, what is the importance of this debate, this motion, to any of us, simple people, the ordinary citizen, I would say it is an important part of protecting the democracy of our nation, the rule of law, and our basic rights as enshrined in the Constitution. <laughs> Madam President, the state, the fate of every democracy, of every government, is based on the sovereignty of the people. It depends on the choices that, it, that, is, that are made between those opposite principles, the absolute power on one hand, and on the other hand, the constraints of legality and tradition. Um, <coughs> Madam President, I really want to say that um, I believe in Trinidad and Tobago. I believe that we, all of us, every citizen of this country, must do our part to protect our democracy our rights, our rights and freedoms as in, enshrined in our constitution, our basic civil rights, but more so we must protect ourselves from either the current or future generations. And we are the ones to do that. We are the ones to ensure that tradition and efficiency come together and that best practices are in place when it comes to the conduct of our parliamentary business. We have had a number of instances where we have had in the public domain um, members of the executive or members of the government uh, um, criticizing the president, for example, in an unbecoming way. We have had uh, the advancement of social media that allows people to express themselves in a way like never before. And it's important for us to establish the separation of powers between the executive, the government, the judiciary, and the legislature, so that we will be very clear, so that there would be no blurred lines. And really, there is nothing that prevents the government from taking the steps to put measures to, to begin this process, um, if they really do want it. And if, Madam President, the government continues to give lip service and give their commitment by their words, but then on the other hand say that we can't do it right now. It means that is a classic case of Mamagai. And I would, like, I would not like to believe that our honorable members on the other side would come to the parliament and give their commitment to something as important to the protection of our democracy, such as the autonomy of parliament, and that it would only come back to Mamagai. We have had a number of instances where the government, even before they became government, made promises to their country, made promises via their manifesto. We have, um, and the sanitists to come to us soon, the government's uh, vision for our country and there are a number of issues in terms of um, dealing with crime, in terms of dealing with the economy and so on, where they would have given their commitment, they would have given their word. And today, 20 months into their term, we are seeing that they have let down the country, they have misled the country on a number of issues. And I would hate to think, I, would, I really would not like to think that they would mislead the parliament on their intention and their commitment to autonomy for the parliament. I, I want to see the, um, the autonomy for this parliament to allow this parliament to freely exercise the competence with which it is vested by the constitution and thus a functional autonomy which manifests itself in the possibility of each um, of this parliament determining its, its own form of organization, its procedures, uh, electing its own bodies, its own committees, um, and of course, answering, not, not being beholden 
to the executive as it is now by answering and reporting to the Minister of Finance, the President or the Speaker of the House would have um, expanded duties as the overall and of course our clerk of the of the House and the Clerk of the Parliament, who over the years have done a tremendous job, will now have in law that protection to continue the work. <laughs> Madam President, uh, um, I, I just want to close by asking the government to give a very clear indication in this debate, whenever one of their members speaks again, whether their commitment to FANA, uh, autonomy for parliament is something that they only agree to in principle or whether they are going to put the necessary measures in place to ensure that this process begins. I think they, it, it is a very simple matter that they can tell the population a yes or no to whether they are actually going to do it or not. There are a number of other pressing issues that relate to the protection of our citizens um, the safety of our, of our, our country. Senator, I mean, you have four minutes. Thank you. The, uh, the, uh, thank you, Madam President. There are a number of issues that relate to the safety and protection of our citizens, the efficiency of the government and our social services, um, the, um, the, the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago um, that I know I would be considered as hot issues, hot topics for the government to treat with. Uh, but at the end of the day, our democracy must be protected and it does not mean that we should neglect what our responsibilities are today um, based on these hot potatoes that face you. I know we have failures where it comes to the, the sea bridge between Trinidad and Tobago. At this time, we have a lot of job losses. We have a spiraling rate of crime and so on. And I consider those things as priorities. But I also think that the protection of our citizens and the protection of our democracy is also very critical to us continuing as a nation. I thank you, Madam President. Senator Henry. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam President, for allowing me to come in a bit late, uh, even though it's only um, minutes to six, I feel like I've been here for a very long time for some reason. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Either I'm having trouble measuring time or I was just very bored. <laughs> Now, I would like to start um, my presentation by looking at an issue raised by my colleague and um, former lecturer at the university, um, Senator Marvier. He touched on the issue of the part-time versus full-time senators. And he correctly pointed out a lot of the work that goes on in any given week. For us um, senators, whether we have portfolio or not, and even on the government side, some of us without portfolio are pretty much in the same uh, situation as independent and opposition senators. As far as um, having to spend a lot of time in this parliament building, some, some days, some weeks, I am here most of Monday Tuesday and Wednesday, in attending to various committees and so on. And I think there was a, we ended up in a situation in this current session, of course this wasn't the case in the session before, which I happened to be part of. Um, we did not spend as much time. Now what happened was that there was an expansion of the committee system, right? And I think that's, I have the concurrence of my colleague over there on that. There's an expansion of the committee system coming into this session, um, beginning September 2015. And that expansion called for the creation of a huge, well, relatively huge number of committees in comparison to what was there before. 
So I, I'm, some of the committees were mentioned, the Energy Committee, the um, National Security, Foreign, Foreign Affairs, and a whole bunch of committees. Now, my understanding from people who were involved in some of these discussions is that primarily this was done on the basis that parliamentarians were going to be full time. All of us. <laughs> All of us, including independents and opposition and non-ministers um, non on the government side. So my understanding is that this expansion was really pred predicated on the grounds of all of us sitting in here at this present moment being a full-time paid employee of the parliament. And of course, well, the ministers, well, that would take care of, 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 of themselves, of itself, right? So what happens and what we are seeing is that the committee system that was based on this notion of that we could be full-time full members um, is being stretched to the limit. And for one, I'm experiencing um, <laughs> some difficult times to tell you the truth, and I think it's, it's not me alone, because, <laughs> because <laughs> I, I'm a, I, I still have a full-time job at the university, thank you. <laughs> and yes, because for example, there are many mornings, especially on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, when I get calls um, saying, well, if you don't come, we don't have a quorum. You know, <laughs> and the calls sometimes sound very desperate because sometimes we have we have a whole entity there with about five um five yes no 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 we we I, we speak the truth we don't we don't we don't care it's it's we're talking about the functioning of the parliament this has nothing to do with government or not and these rules were passed by your government well, and and adopted okay so. Uh, you were in charge. <laughs> and so what I'm just saying is that this is the reality. Now, um, and part of the problem, which I'll, I'll get to in a, in a later on, is the public perception of parliament. Now, the committees are stretched um, to the point where, you know, we have a minimum um, on many of the committees. And if one or two members happen to be inconvenienced, and cannot come uh, to a particular meeting or have to cancel at the last minute, like a family emergency or something, the committees may not even function. And I, I remember in the first session, the committees were overstaffed deliberately to cater for that eventuality, that if you have a large number of members on the committees, and some can come, the committees could still function. That was the, the basis on how it operated before. So you wouldn't have pressure on just one or two people, um, one or two people to constantly show up, otherwise the committee just can't function. And, and again, it's difficult when you get a call saying, well, we have Ministry of Education in front of us, and Caribbean Airlines, and so on, and if you don't come, you basically waste the time of all these people coming down here because the committee has to be canceled. Because we don't have the proper quorum to go forward. Yes, and I've had some desperate calls from Senator Small on, on this matter. <laughs> to in, so therefore, we are under pressure. And because of the scenario where the discussion of us being full-time, that's why I raised the issue. Uh, that has become, well, null and void at this point, right? So we ended up in a kind of half-pregnant situation where we, <laughs> where we expected to do quite a bit. And I'm saying this not to criticize any, no, no. It, it, it is also to let the public know that we do a lot of work. 
And I think it's the same point some of the independent senators have made, and even some in the opposition. So no, I'm, I'm saying it in the context to let the public know that we do quite a bit of work, and it's very time consuming, right? And on top of that, many of my colleagues to my left, well, all of them, are ministers with heavy portfolios. So if it's difficult for me, I'm sure it's terribly difficult for all of them. Right? So what you see happening is that we, we burden ourselves intentionally or, or not, and we end up in a very difficult situation having to deal with all of these committees and do serious work because the public is looking at the parliament to do serious work. Now, of course, one of the things that I um, picked up when looking through material for this debate is that, in fact, in many instances, the public perception of the parliament is the number one reason why people oppose parliamentary autonomy. And my colleague, Senator Gopi Schoon, had alluded to some public comments about the process and about the feeling that people had towards the parliament. And this is a serious issue. In fact, in some of what I read, they said that is the most pressing reason why many countries have undergone to parliamentary autonomy, especially with regard to spending. Because the public perception of the parliament is that we're a bunch of jokers, that we sit around and laugh and go to the tea room, and we don't, you know, we don't get anything done, um, just a talk shop. And that is not true only in Trinidad and Tobago, I discovered. You know, we like to think that somehow we're special here and it only happens here. In many jurisdictions, that is the same that obtains, that people think their parliament is not really functioning properly. And that they don't, they don't, they don't feel they're getting value for money. And then to turn around and tell them, well, the parliament wants its own budget <laughs> to spend as much as they want and do whatever they like, and you think, oh yeah, we're not going for that. So this is one of the problems we encounter. And if you look at some of what is happening in, around the world, I mean, many countries have obviously gone to full parliamentary autonomy. Some of them have it enshrined in their constitution, like India. And, so so they, and many others have adopted something similar, as we know. And for all of the good reasons that were outlined by speakers before me as to why the parliament should have a serious or a fair degree of autonomy. Right? But the perception of parliament um, being not working in the service properly of the people and so on is that critical factor that we need to take stock of. That is why the consultation and the deliberations with stakeholders and so on become so important. In fact, the, one of the ironic things when we complement the parliamentary staff here in this building is that usually you get applause from all sides. Right? You get um, the independents, the opposition, and the government all agreeing on that. I, in my seven years here, I've never heard any complaint about the functioning of the staff and the efficiency of the staff, all of them, through various ministers, through various incarnations. But on the other hand, you have such hardworking people and the staff, and yet we, the parliamentarians, get a bad rap at the same time. Also, I've made some suggestions that one of the things we have to do is to increase the visibility, not just the parliamentary TV, of what we do. 
and the parliament should probably try to um, let the public know that there are committees working on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when all they see is the Tuesday and then the Friday. So in fact, huh? no, we're full parliament, not committee. Right? And I've also, in fact, I think I made a suggestion that um, maybe there should be a, a screen on the outside of the building when people walking by to say committee in session, committee on foreign affairs. Thank you. <laughs> committee on energy in process. <laughs> So, so you have, so no, that would be, so you, so people walking by on Rison Road there and Dock Road, driving by, could see that, you know, we have a session in progress, that something is happening, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not just an empty building when the cameras are off, or, or and, and of course, sometimes we have in cam, um, off camera sessions, and the public doesn't know any better. So if we have a, a committee, a, a nice billboard outside that um, shows what we're doing on any given day. I'm sure there are sessions going on. Now, given the amount of committees that I talked about um, that we have, um, I'm, there's something go going on almost all, all the time. And we could benefit from that. I mean, I'm saying it with a little bit of tongue in cheek, but we need to get the public out there to understand that we do good work. And we do, um, we do create significant changes. Now sometimes, frequently, frequently when I sit anywhere to cool out, somebody inevitably comes up to me and say, I saw you on the committee with Senator Small questioning um, Caribbean Airlines. That was good. Great, great, great questions. You know, you really put them on the spot. But anyhow, we know nothing will happen <laughs> because that's just a waste of time. You know, because you all already, what action could you take? Could you get them fired? You know, could you replace anybody? Could you really do anything? And now, in fact, that attitude is being changed because people are feeling that we are actually doing work that is relevant, the more exposure we get. And the, po the point is that these things are public hearings of the parliament that were set up to be public for a reason, that we want to get the information out there to the public and increase the level of transparency in the operations of the government and in the, gov in the operation of state-run enterprises, and so on, so that the people out there could appreciate what we are doing. And now, so in terms of the, our own propaganda, so to speak, we need to be a little bit more aware in terms of getting things out there to the public, changing that perception, and I think that would be a key step in getting the public to support um, full autonomy for the parliament, including financial autonomy. And I've, I've looked at the information out there based on parliamentary autonomy. And in many of the big, bigger countries, we have this situation where they actually have two separate committees one for the lower house and one for the upper house, one for the Senate. Like in, in the Australian case, they, they put, they have a um, equivalent to the House of Commons or the House of Representatives, they have their own committee and the Senate also has their own committee in terms of appropriating funds and running their affairs, right? And I believe the, the lower house committee gets about 0.35% of, 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 of a percent of the overall national budget, and the Senate gets half of 1% of the, 
of the national budget to run their affairs. So you know, senator, you know, senators always get less. So, <laughs> so we have to think about that. Whether in our situation it would be best to go with a two separate committees or one committee. Most of the speakers I heard have generally spoken on the condition that there was some one committee would be set up. Now there are advantages and disadvantages, of course, in terms of resources in having a separate Senate committee and a separate lower house committee. Now, one of the advantages is that in the Australian case that I, I looked at is that they say, well, if you have two committees, it's harder for the government to ignore both, if they, especially if they come up with the same recommendation, right? as opposed to just having one committee, which could be easier dismissed. Now, before I um, reach the end, I, I want to make this point about the money bills that was mentioned by a couple of speakers before. Because as far as we are aware, and it was spoken of by one or two people, that the Senate cannot really interfere with a money bill. And that has to do, I, I believe, with the fact that nobody voted for us. That we are all here at the behest of some individual, not the entire, not a, but by vote of the population. In fact, when I ask, well, where did that come from? Why is it so um, entrenched that money bills cannot be interfered with basically in the Senate? That is the rationale. They say the lower house represents the people who were voted for by the population. Nobody voted for you, so tough luck. Right? I mean, I could accept that because that's what it is. But the strange thing <laughs> is that in the original intention of this things like setting up of the Senate and so on. It was the other way around. Because they say, well, if the Senate interferes with the bill and make too much changes, the little house have full veto over it. Now, in the original intention, when the Senate, like the House of Lords or the upper houses of all these Commonwealth jurisdictions, was mainly put there to have a check and balance of the law house in case they got carried away. You had rich people sitting in the Senate overseeing them. So if they got ideas based on popular vote that they would like to redistribute the wealth, you had a Senate up there saying, hey, you know, cool it. Not so fast. <laughs> you know. So we were supposed to be the ones in the, in the original perception to come and say no, no, to put a check on too much extravagance and um, extreme popularism on the part of the lower house. But I think that's another question that is probably not going to happen anytime in my tenure here, but the question of whether senators are elected or appointed and whether that system should also be changed to having senators elected. Because on a few of the trips, well, I only went on two trips since I've been in Parliament, and many of the people we interacted with on those trips, um, the first thing they ask you is, how, when were you elected? When you sit down in Australia and all these places, you sit down with um, parliamentarians, and you say, well, I wasn't. And they almost look at you as being illegitimate. Well, then what are you doing here? You know. And it's, it's, it's a real issue. So we could, um, and I think, and I think, <laughs> and I think that's the two issues of being full-time, part-time, and also having the, a say in critical matters like the financing and so on, is, has to do with also the election versus selection approach to, to electing members of the Senate. I thank you. I thank you, Madam President. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Madam President, on that note, I beg to move that the Senate do now adjourn to Thursday the 25th of May at 2.30 p.m. 2.30 p.m. At, at, at this, at, on that sitting, we will be de doing a bill entitled an, an Act to Amend the Fire Services Act, Chapter 3550. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to Thursday, the 25th of May, 2017, at 2.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. This Senate now stands adjourned to Thursday, the 25th of May, 2017, at 2.30 p.m.